guys of Minnesota sports flowing in their veins. Mackie and Judd on Score North and scorenorth.com. Reckless speculation. That's right, Reckless Speculation Thursday. It is not. It is Tuesday, but if you are watching this, you can see it's Judd, it's Declan, and, of course, Darren Doogie Wolfson, because we can recklessly speculate and get the scoops on any day of the week, and we do it on Tuesdays, basically as a pregame show for the exciting Thursday Reckless Speculation lifestyle that we all love. Darren, welcome in. Um, Let's start here. Let's start with the Vikings, who have been off obviously, since uh, beating the Patriots on Thursday, getting prepared to play the New York Jets and Mike White now at quarterback on Sunday. What can you tell us about the buzz around the Vikings and perhaps getting Dalvin Tomlinson back in the middle of that defensive line? Well, an hour ago, Judd, I caught up with former Viking, current Jets tight end, Tyler Conklin. We Zoomed. He got me all fired up for Sunday, clearly, This is a big one for him. When I last spoke with Tyler back in mid to late April, right after the schedule came out, he said, okay, December 4th, I have that circled. So I wanted to catch up with Tyler now that the countdown is no longer months, it's days. So he's all pumped up. His fiance will be in the stands. She'll be sitting with the Vikings wives and girlfriends in the Vikings family section just because she has those relationships. Mm -hmm. He still maintains contact with Kirk Cousins, with Eric Kendricks, with Brian O'Neill, with Irv Smith Jr. So Tyler still has all sorts of friendships here. A reminder, I said this back in April or even in March when he signed with the Jets. The Bengals also had heavy interest, but I'll reiterate it now. Like the Vikings just didn't have interest, you know, and that's the business, right? Like Conklin, fifth round pick, a lot of fifth round picks never get to a second contract. He got to a second contract at three years, 21 million. So it worked out well. His role in that offense, heck, any receiver's role, tight end or receiver in that offense, especially when Zach Wilson was the quarterback, yes. is evolving. But he told me there is definitely a comfort level with Mike White. On the Vikings, Judd, if that Vikings-Patriots game was on Sunday, not Thursday, it was trending in the direction of Dalvin Tomlinson being able to play. In fact, the Vikings really thought, Judd, he would be back for the Dallas game. Now, I was reminded by somebody who forgets more about football injuries than I'll ever know, forgets more in five seconds than I'll ever know, that it is worth pointing out that Tomlinson, calf injury, big man, like large individuals trying to come back from a calf injury. Yes. Easier said than done. It's yep. been a bit of a roller coaster. But he was able to do some stuff last Wednesday, was able to do some stuff yesterday. They did practice on Monday, day off today. He should be able to do more stuff Wednesday and Thursday. So barring any sort of setback, the Vikings should get back Dalvin Tomlinson on Sunday. It is also trending in the right direction for a Caleb Evans to return. Now on Monday, he was still in that red, no contact jersey. That means he's pretty much stage four not quite stage five, all the way cleared, but he is trending in the right direction. Now on Cam Dantzler Sr., still on the IR, he says he'll be back for the Detroit game on December 11th. Judd, if it's not that game, it'll be December 18th against the Colts. Like, I wouldn't rule out maybe one extra week, but like I alluded to this, can't remember if it was on mic or off mic. I believe it was with you in the last seven to 14 days. I just, I told you, somebody told me to check on the possibility that it would be longer for Cam. Well, it won't be. There is optimism that he'll be back, you know, mid-December at the latest. Like, this is not a season-ending injury. On Andrew Booth Jr., in all likelihood, a season-ending injury. Third surgery in the last 18 months. On Christian Derisaw, somebody I know who is friends with Christian, spent some time with him right after Thanksgiving. He's feeling well, doing okay, but like to suggest that we'll see him this Sunday, I think is a bit of a leap, but like that's not a season ending injury either. Now, second concussion in a two week stretch, that's frightening in many ways, but there is optimism that come mid-December, Christian Derisaw will be back. 
on Booth, this was the concern, right, Dukes? That the, the perception was that he would have been a first-round pick, but he had been hurt. So I guess th- that this is an unfortunate extension. And I will say this, it's sad, but I mean, it is amazing how often since he was drafted, he's been hurt. Like he immediately, uh, they, they didn't practice him in the spring. And then in training camp, I believe, right? He got hurt. He got hurt in the game. Um, this has to be a concern because when you're young and you are undergoing this many surgeries and you're hurt this much in football, I got to think that it uh, causes some red flags to go up. Well, I mean, the red flags were up pre-draft. Right, but now, Like, again. there were teams that had, you know, medical checks next to his name saying, yeah, we can't take him, certainly can't take him day one or day two if we want to roll the dice day three. But in all likelihood, somebody will take the chance. It ends up being the Vikings very early day two, what, 35th overall or right in that neighborhood but like there were a number of teams judd that would not have touched him in the 30s 40s or 50s or 60s like there were teams that had legitimate concern pre-draft with booth also remember he was on special teams week one against green bay got hurt yep then he was supposed to be back i had a number of conversations you can go to my twitter and find those conversations many conversations with him Throughout that process, like at one point, he thought he'd be back week three for that Lions game. Then not only was he not back for that game, but he wasn't back then for the London game, the Saints game. So, like, the time frame was all over the place. So, yeah, I mean, it's been multiple injuries now since he's been a Viking. I mean, you know, let's call it what it is. It's not the final chapter being written. He still has a chance to be a very, very fine player. But so far, a swing and a miss by the Vikings front office. Heck. If you look at the totality of the draft class, I know, right? I mean, I'm yeah. not even quite sure if Lewis Seen was healthy, if he was going to ever earn legit defensive snaps this year, certainly special teams, but I'm not sure he was going to earn legit defensive snaps this year. But again, final chapter not written on Seen. Ed Ingram, okay. I'm glad he's on the field, I guess, but work in progress. Work in progress, to say the least. Yeah. At Caleb Evans, we see flashes. Asamoa, good special teamer, maybe eventually can slide into a starting job on defense. So I think there's hope certainly with Asamoa, but just a bunch of giant question marks with Quasi's first draft class. Yes, and uh, guess who, who would look really good good here if the, the Vikings had stayed with their first round pick, Kyle well, Hamilton. I mean, yeah, Kyle Hamilton. I mean, you, yeah, I mean, you talked about that a lot. Solid, yeah, in Baltimore. Heck, how about? Jamison Williams, right? I mean, he'll be back here at some point, you know, for Detroit. I don't know if he'll be back as soon as that Vikings game on December 11th. But the Alabama wide receiver, if the Vikings just wanted to stay there, like I think he's got a chance to be pretty darn good. I'll tell you what, though. The Vikings had a healthy opinion of Jets rookie receiver Garrett Wilson. The Vikings never had a chance. He never got as far as that Vikings pick in the first round before they moved all the way backwards. Yep. But the Vikings had a healthy opinion of Wilson. I'll tell you what, Garrett Wilson looks the part of a big-time wide receiver. Interesting stuff. Uh, sp- speaking of that, let's, for one second before we get to what transpired with the Twins, let's recklessly speculate about this. I don't know if there would be much buzz yet, uh, but there's no question that before the 2023 Viking season starts, Justin Jefferson is going to break the bank and get paid. Do we have any idea or just um, speculating about what they might have to do to create that that space? Because the signing bonus is going to be absolutely huge. It, it's all a bit confusing with the cap, but I'm guessing some decisions on veterans are going is going are going to have to be made. Excuse me, uh, that are going to probably surprise some fans, but will be well worth it to make Justin Jefferson happy. Yeah, I mean you're right. The headline to this talking point is it's a stone cold lock. The Vikings yeah. will make Justin Jefferson before next season, maybe as soon as March or April, but if it trends into July or August, fine. But before the start of the 2023 season, the Vikings are going to make Justin Jefferson the highest paid wide receiver in the game. So you're right. Other moves will need to be made. Judd, I'll be frank. I have not taken a deep dive. I haven't gone down the rabbit hole of looking at the Vikings cap sheet for 2023 you know, first guess, first, you know, inclination is Eric Kendricks, is Harrison Smith. 
I just don't know what the dead money is. I remember the Adam Thielen it's a lot. restructure or, or I want to frame that. That'll be a tough one, right? Because there's enough dead money where it looks like Thielen is here not only for this year, but also next year. If I recall correctly, right, just top of my head, if I recall, you know, and he's got some local representation, my buddy Blake Barrett's. Yeah. And I can heck reach out to Blake right this second. He's been on, you know, this station, my podcast a number of times. Blake is great, so he can lay it out. But if I recall, all the signs pointed to Thielen being here through the 23 season. Yes. But I would take a look at some of those guys on defense. And, heck, I still think Kendricks has enough good football in him. But if they can escape that contract potentially, and I don't know what the dead money is on on Smith, but that would have to be another one we'd have to take a look at. Because you start going out even a couple of years. I mean, Christian Derisaw yeah. is on the way to becoming, you know, about the highest paid left tackle in the game. Now I get it, the cap is going up. But – Hard decisions will continue to have to be made. But those are two guys that come to mind. I don't know if there's some other guys that come to mind for you, but like first inclination is I would take a look at the linebacker situation, the safety situation. Running back as well, I think, is going to be one. That's well, yeah, Madison's change. a free agent. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, with this being a 60-40 passing offense, right, yeah. not that they're completely devaluing the run, but, you know, if if you have this offense and this offense isn't going anywhere – does it make sense to have a top five to top eight, you know, paid running back in the game? So, yeah, gotcha. I certainly could see something along those lines as well. Okay, Duke, explain to me what the decision, which, by the way, the decision itself was not a surprise. The timing might be. But big picture, what does 40-year-old Joe Polad now becoming what I would consider being the point person because it sounds like Jim is still going to be involved, so it's not like he's done. Uh, but what does Joe becoming the point person mean for the Twins franchise? Yeah, and by the way, I'd like to know a little bit more. So tell Joe, if Joe listens to this, Joe, text me back. I'm trying to get some FaceTime with Joe in the this, very, Dukes. very near he's young. future. He's 40. Do this. Yeah, Digits. Well, Call me. Yeah. I've Look at Declan. I've he's like, yeah, him. I would think at 40 years dead. old, he's a texter. Right. He's not like yeah. my father in law who doesn't even have an iPhone. Right. He's got an iPhone because it was a blue message that went through. But yeah, at some point here, I'll just pick up the phone and try to call him, not text him. But the word was going back a month. So it was a month ago, Judd, that the twins sent out a notice to all employees to be in the office on Tuesday, November 29th mm -hmm. for an all staff meeting. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that's something that takes some time to coordinate. So employees were given a month's notice. So some light bulbs went off then. Mm -hmm. Then a couple Fridays ago at the fashion show, the Twins uniform unveiling, brouhaha at Mall of America, Dave St. Peter introduces Joe Polad. Now, Joe's been involved in branding. He had his fingerprints on this new look. But that also raised some eyebrows. Why was it Joe Polad? Yes. addressing the 500 to 1,000 people there in the rotunda. So I wasn't overly surprised. You're right. I mean, this was inevitable. It was when, not if. Now, if you told me, hey, was it going to happen on November 28th? I mm -hmm. might have said, okay, maybe that's a bit aggressive. But, like, this was always going to happen. I mean, he's been groomed for this. He's been doing different jobs with the Twins, with the companies the poll ads either have owned or do own now for 15 years, like going back to 2007, right? So this was always going to happen. What I'm curious to find out, Joe, because I don't have all the answers, although I do have the letter right here that, and I emailed it to you. Yeah, right. I don't know if there's anything that's fantastic to read to the audience right now, but this is the letter that Jim Polad sent to all employees, just pointing out that, this will mark the 40th season that the Polad family has owned the Twins. He does say there's some verbiage here. Please join me in congratulating Joe on this well-deserved promotion. As a member of the Twins front office for the past 15 years, Joe has grown as a leader while building impactful relationships across the organization. As we look to the future, our family is highly confident in Joe's ability to push the franchise forward in meaningful ways. So what does this mean I will tell you, Joe is going to be in the office a lot more than Jim was. I also sense, I'd like to have a conversation with Dave St. Peter, whether on the record 
or maybe more so on background if he's willing to do that at some point. But I get the sense that Dave, when needed, was able to keep Jim Polad at an arm's length. And Jim wasn't going to offer a ton of resistance. I just have a hard time believing that Joe is the same way. Now, that doesn't mean that's a bad thing. In fact, we could debate that will be a good thing. Now, hey, there's nepotism in play here, right? I mean, let's well, not yeah, let's not sugarcoat business. it, right? I mean, yeah. heck, any other 40-year-old with his credentials doesn't ascend to executive chair, right? Yeah. It just doesn't happen, right? So I talked to one Twins employee who, you know, pointed that out, just said, hey, you know, I don't mind Joe as a person, right? He's outgoing, you know, he's tried for 15 years to really learn this whole organization. But let's just be frank. If his last name wasn't Polad, he's not becoming the executive chair. Right. But right. that doesn't mean he can't evolve in this role, that he can't have a meaningful, as Jim pointed out in the letter to employees on Monday, can't have some sort of meaningful impact. Now, in terms of like the infrastructure, will there be drastic changes like, I have a hard time believing that. Like, I just don't see Joe saying, okay, go ahead, Derek. Let's bring that payroll up to $230 million. Right. Right? Like, that's not happening anytime soon. Right? But, like, you think about Carlos Correa's representation, right? Scott Boris likes to involve ownership. Jim, my understanding was, was like, nah, like maybe at the very end, but – Derek and Thad and those guys, they can take care of the negotiations. Dave, like, I don't need to be involved. Joe might say, you know what, Scott, if you want to have a conversation, sure, come to me. So, like, in the immediate future, that's something I could potentially foresee. I'm not suggesting that's a done deal, that Joe is going to have his fingerprints all over the Korea negotiations. I'm just saying that is something that I could see play itself out. By the way, on those negotiations, they will ramp up even more Starting on Sunday, the winter meetings begin in San Diego. So the Twins will have more face-to-face -face dialogue with Scott then. Okay, I, I want to get to that in a second, but let's go back on Joe. Um, recklessly speculating, my guess is this. It feels to me like this might be more of a business involvement, which, which you know, I think Jim basically let Dave run it. Um, I don't know if Joe is going to be it, – it's not that he won't be involved in baseball, but I think if we're expecting him to tell – Falvey to fire Rocco, that ain't going to happen. But it does feel like, and, and exactly from what you said, with the Mall of America, which Joe probably picked because the Twins don't ordinarily go to the mall to do things. Um, it they feel, spent a lot of money on yeah, that presentation, by the way. But that's what I'm saying. Is a this, lot of money. This feels like it might be more of, of a business move to try and – get fans back because there are things that they they could could do and dave's done a great job but dave has been there a long time as well so i wonder if this is more of a trying to get people to buy into the twins from a fan perspective because i just don't see joe going crazy baseball wise well yeah i don't see joe going crazy baseball wise either i think it's all encompassing right like because we knew this was going to happen jim is now 69 years old we can still debate whether, like. Do we really feel like Jim truly loves baseball or was he just the logical son after Carl's passing yeah. with Bob and Bill Polad having, you know, interest in, in other areas with Jim being the banker? Like it just it sort of was just like this move was inevitable when Carl passed. It was inevitable whether he wanted to or not that Jim was going to take over. Yeah. But I truly don't know if Jim Really, really, really loves baseball. Yes, he enjoys baseball, but is he as passionate as many other owners? And you reached out to me with that very question yesterday yep. via text. Does Joe love baseball? That would be among the first questions I will ask him. I figure at some point I'll get some FaceTime with him. I hope so. Um, on Correa, question here that, that I've not seen broached a lot, but I think it's important. Uh, as this unfolds and he and he and his agent Scott Boris make the decision. If I'm not mistaken, Scott Boris also represents Xander Bogarts. So he how does, well and Carlos Rodon, who the twins were all in on, not to the extent of the money the Giants offered, but last offseason the twins were all over Carlos Rodon. So 
you know, if Bogarts ends up, let's say, back with the Red Sox, Correa ends up with the Cubs or the Giants, do the Twins pivot to another Boris client that isn't necessarily a shortstop, but a guy that would help them? Yeah, but I guess my question is this on Bogarts and Correa. What's the shell game there? Because it seems like if you if you represent them both, you're going to tie them together in some way, shape, or form as, as far as the decisions and signings go. Uh, I just... I wonder what the involvement of two players who play the same position are both high profile guys and and their eventual destinations mean from this as the long play for Scott because Boris is if nothing else incredibly controlling and manipulative of situations as we saw with Correa picking the Twins when they couldn't find a long term deal they liked and he has a history of stretching these negotiations into late January into February. Now, the comeback to that, Judd, is he's got so many high-profile free agent clients, Cody Bellinger, Michael Conforto. Does he have Nemo as well? Like, he's got so many guys. Right. You can go to MLB Trade Rumors, go to Agency Database, look at his clients, match them up with a list of free agents. Like, he's pretty much running free agency. Now, he doesn't have Dansby Swanson. He doesn't have Trey Turner, so he doesn't have every marquee free agent. He doesn't have Verlander, but he's got so many guys that there is a thought he's going to take one or two guys off the board maybe as soon as this time next week when Mm. the winter meetings really ramp up next Monday and Tuesday. So it is possible maybe these conversations have already been had that, okay, Minnesota, There is genuine interest in Carlos returning to your organization. He really did like it there. His wife really liked it there. But we have a $280 million deal out there, whether that's the Cubs. telling you, I've been saying it since the summer. I mean, the Cubs are absolutely a team to watch on Craya, but the Giants as well, and I'm sure some others. I mean, the Dodgers apparently are dabbling a little bit. There's enough teams. We're – Scott may go to the Twins at some point if he hasn't already and said, okay, like I have a $280 million deal out there and we're just, we're not going to turn down that sort of money. So if you want to approach that money, fine, but maybe the Twins know, okay, like we're not going as high as 280, 285. So then let's pivot. You don't need to spend even $200 million to sign Bogarts. Heck, you could probably sign Judd Xander Bogarts and a pretty good starting pitcher, like a Chris Bassett, who, by the way, the Twins have not touched base on at all. Free agency is fluid, right? It's such a slow play, but I checked last night, Judd. That's a pitcher I'd love to see here. Now, the Twins have more interest in adding a lefty starter, like a Rodon, maybe a Quintana, although the Twins have not touched base on Quintana. There's some other lefties out there as well. Sean Manaya was a guy the Twins had some trade interest in, last year so he was on their radar last year when they had some trade discussions with the Oakland A's so he's out there in the free agent market so I wouldn't necessarily rule out his name so there's a little bit more interest in adding a lefty starter but to me you could just add a good starter I don't care lefty or righty so I really like Chris Bassett I'm just saying if you wanted to you could sign Bogarts and a pitcher like Bassett for the same amount of money it would take to re-sign Carlos Correa could you make a case now I'll admit I am a huge Xander Bogarts fan. Just to play in that fishbowl, like I don't think people realize how hard it is to be a Boston Red Sox. Like it is really hard. That is just, it is a tough environment. And he's succeeded, right? So like I can make a case. Yes, is Carlos Correa the better player? Yes, I'm not debating that. But I don't know if it's that, you know, I don't know if there's that much separation, Correa and Bogarts. So if you could sign Bogarts, for five or six years at 140, 150, 160, 170, even something like that. Could you make a case that that makes more sense? Sign Bogarts, sign a good starting pitcher, let Correa go to San Francisco or Chicago or somewhere else. But the Twins are not quite to that point. Priority number one is finding a way to bring back Carlos Correa. And let's wrap with this. What what can you tell us about what what is the mess, despite the fact that they are 10 and 11, the record's not terrible, the mess that is the Timberwolves, though, another dreadful performance against uh, Washington on Monday night. Yeah, well, I mean, first and foremost, you know, what is the extent of the Carl Anthony Towns injury? There is optimism that he escaped 
major injury undergoing an MRI. Frankly, we're sitting here talking at 1145. You know, he might still be in that MRI machine or just got out of it. I'm not quite sure we have the results quite yet. But there was some optimism late last night that he avoided a catastrophe, Good. right? But if it's a grade two or grade three calf strain, like they would know right away. There's testing they can do to figure out if he had torn his Achilles. Yeah. So the fact we didn't hear late last night that it was a torn Achilles, that is good. Yep. But like a grade two or grade three calf strain, that can be many weeks. I mean, Jordan McLaughlin right now has a grade one calf strain. That's a seven to 10 day injury. He's 50-50 to play tomorrow against Memphis. If he's not back against Memphis, he'll be back on Saturday against Oklahoma City. But I tweeted out McLaughlin's short-term injury. I didn't say he'd be back in a game or two. He was always going to miss three or four games, right? So Cat could miss two to four to six-ish weeks with a grade two or grade three calf strain. Whether he plays or not, Judd, they give up more open looks than any team in the league. They stink in first quarters. Typically when they lose the first quarter, they lose the game. They can't defend the paint. Judd, did you watch Friday in Charlotte? Did you watch no. last night? I know Second Porzingis half. was making three after three, but they don't protect the paint. Rudy Gobert isn't blocking shots like he has in the past. Oh, yeah. Judd, I hear there's some finger pointing going on. You know, maybe not a surprise, but some finger pointing going on over at Mayo Clinic Square. Let's not forget Dell Demps was with Utah. I mean, he pushed for Gobert. Now, Tim Connolly said yes. Tim Connolly, trust me, was all in on acquiring Rudy Gobert, but I can't help but wonder if Tim doesn't hire Dell. You know, is this the move that is made? Or maybe Tim convinces himself to go all in on DeJounte Murray. They had discussions with the San Antonio Spurs. DeJounte Murray is looking really good with the Atlanta Hawks. DeJounte Murray would have looked good here. The Wolves were interested. Right? In hindsight, you'd love to Undo the trade. You'd love to go back and say, okay, we're giving up all these first-round picks. Let's acquire DeJounte Murray. Now, 21-game sample size, way too small sample size. But so far, the trade has been a failure. I don't know one person, Judd, that wouldn't go back and undo the trade. You know, if they could do it, everybody would, right? And I was all in in July. I said, hey, for a franchise that's been so rock bottom for so long, I'm okay swinging for the fences. But clearly, 21 games in, this swing for the fences has been a failure. They've only played one complete game, Judd. Outside of the game six days ago in Indiana, the night before Thanksgiving, and Indiana came into that game with a five-game winning streak, like the Wolves, for 48 minutes, that was a complete effort. Outside of that game, find me a game in these first 21 where they've had a complete effort. That's the only one. That's what's so troubling. Then you follow up that complete effort, that great effort in Indiana, with what you put on the floor against Charlotte. Then Golden State shoots the lights out on Sunday. Washington shoots the lights out last night, but certainly had success in the paint, right? I mean, at some point, I don't sense Chris Finch is on the hot seat right this second, but at some point, it's hard not to wonder with Quinn Snyder being out there, a guy that knows how to coach Ooh. Rudy Gobert, it's hard not to wonder. That might fit the theme on Thursday a little bit better, the reckless speculation Thursday, because I'm just telling you, the fact is Chris Finch received a nice contract extension in late March, early April. The Wolves are not pivoting. Heck, right. if you look at the standings, the Wolves are only, what, two or three games, two and a half, three and a half games out of, like, second place or first place in the conference. So they are not firing Chris Finch right. anytime real soon. But I'm just saying, with a coach who knows Rudy Gobert's game so well, it's hard not to wonder if at some point it trends down that road, but we're not there yet. But I'm just telling you, there is some finger pointing I hear going on over at Mayo Clinic Square. Interesting stuff. Final scoops before we go. What else you got? Well, I mean, the Wolves do have a second round pick in June, New York second round pick. So they had a bunch of scouts out and about over the weekend at all these Thanksgiving holiday tournaments, including Zarko Durisic, senior player personnel guy. He was at the Phil Knight Invitational. So out in Portland, it was Duke, North Carolina, Purdue, Gonzaga, Iowa State, Alabama, Michigan State. So one-stop shopping, right? You're in one city, you know, two gyms that, you know, are five-minute walk from each other. 
Sure. And he got to watch a bunch of high-level basketball. I was surprised that Mo Abraham, Ibrahim of the Gophers was not a finalist for the Doak Walker Award. So the running back from Michigan, running back from Illinois, running back from Texas are the three finalists. That, to me, is a travesty. Good stuff, and we will talk to you on uh, Reckless Speculation Thursday. You got a Tyler Newbin likely going pro. Brevin Span Ford. Agents are pushing for him to go pro, but he really likes playing for PJ Fleck, enjoys being a gopher, the St. Cloud native. So I would not be shocked at all if Brevin Span Ford is back for a sixth year. But to me, he should go pro, even though the 24 draft is not looking like a real strong tight end draft. The 23 draft, next year's draft, is a strong tight end draft but to me the nil money just isn't there for these gophers players Mm -hmm. if you're in a position to go pro like brevin is i would go pro but as i sit here today i wouldn't be shocked still working on that storyline but i wouldn't be shocked if he's back for a sixth year great stuff talk to you dukes okay see you boys bye-bye